Good evening. Time for service again. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. First song will be number 213. 213. <clears throat> to the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our Master has trod. With the balm of His counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master to the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner our glory shall be. While we herald the tide, think salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes to the world. To the work in the strength of the Lord, and a robe and a crown shall our labor reward. In the home of the faithful, our dwelling shall be, and we shall, with a ransom, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master Number 262, 262. <clears throat> work for the night is coming, work through the morning hour. Work while the dew is sparkly, work mid-springing flower. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun, work for the night is coming, when man's work is done. Work for the night is coming, work through the sunny noon, fill brightest hours with labor. Rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. Work for the night is coming when man works no more. Work for the night is coming under the sunset skies, while their bright tents are glowing, work for daylight flies, work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more, work while the night is darkening, 
when man's work is old. At this time, Brother Mark will have a open prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we always want to thank you for all the many daily blessings that you give us. We pray that you give us strength and courage to always do your will, to be good examples to others. Let us tonight have an open mind and have the strength and courage to do do what we learn, use what we learn in tonight's lesson and use it in our daily lives. Guide, guard, and direct us in everything that we do. Watch over us and keep us safe. In Christ's name. Number 276, 276. <clears throat> o oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. Well, Scripture reading this evening is from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 3. Psalm Psalm 80, verses 1 through 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. If you do not have a handout, raise your hand and we will get you one. <clears throat> this is a handout. We have a couple up here. <clears throat> this is a handout that's going to categorize the different psalms that there are. As we started a few weeks ago, a, a study in the book of Psalms, As you look into the book of Psalms, this book of uh, poetry, Hebrew poetry, as you study the books, and as you study from those who have studied the books, depending on who you read from, will determine how they categorize the Psalms. 
One author will give you ten different categories, and another author will give you uh, six to seven. So what I came up with with this chart here is a basically a seven point category for the book of Psalms. If you read at the very top, it says the book of Psalms is a collection of prayers, poems, and hymns that focus the worshiper's thoughts on God in praise and adoration. The 150 individual Psalms can be placed into the following seven categories. And what we're going to do as we continue this Sunday night series in the book of Psalms is we're going to take two Psalms from each of these seven categories and learn from them. We've already looked at one, of course, uh, Psalm 1, and we've looked at one that falls in the category of point number one on the handout. Point number one is individual and community psalms for God's deliverance. These are psalms that discuss and talk about God rescuing either an individual or a nation of people, Israel, from their enemies. Remember, we looked at Psalm 3 last week, falls into that category. Tonight, we're going to look at Psalm 80. We're not going to look at every one of these psalms that are listed. This is for your personal study. We're going to take two from each point, and we're going to use this in our series. So these are psalms that are used to, to show the, the worshiper crying out to God for deliverance. The second category is psalms of thanksgiving and praise. These are psalms that you have in them the psalmist praising God and thanking God. And you have the various listings of psalms that fall under that category. Point number three, enthronement psalms exalting God's sovereign rule. Sometimes these psalms, as we're going to see, overlap a little bit. And the enthronement psalms talk about God ruling on His throne. Enthronement refers to being on the throne. God is the ruler over His creation. And the Psalms are listed there. Point number four. Royal Psalms which portray the reign of the earthly king as well as the heavenly king of Israel. These are Psalms that talk about the earthly king of the nation of Israel and also talk about the heavenly king of Israel. And they do overlap a little bit in their category with the enthronement Psalms of point number three. There you have the Psalms listed. Point number five, pilgrimage Psalms, which were sung by worshipers as they traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the Hebrew festivals. These were pilgrimages that they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the, uh, the festivals that were given through Moses. And these Psalms were written during these pilgrimages by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are written about the pilgrimages, and so the Psalms there are listed. Psalm 6, or excuse me, point number 6, Wisdom Psalms which instruct in the way of righteous living. The first Psalm that we looked at, Psalm 1, falls into that category. A Wisdom Psalm, contrasting righteousness with unrighteousness, wise decision with unwise decision. And they're very, very similar to the wisdom literature of the book of Proverbs. Those psalms there are listed. And point number seven, vengeance psalms invoking God's wrath and judgment against enemies. These are very unusual psalms in which the psalmist is calling for vengeance upon the enemies of God's people. We have to keep in mind as we get to point number seven in our series, that the nation of Israel was a physical, political empire ruled by an earthly king. And they did have enemies that needed to be dealt with in a physical way. And we'll talk about that more when we get to point number seven. So as I said before, <clears throat> some of these psalms overlap in the categories. For example, if you look at number seven there, 
you find Psalm 139 in that. But you will also uh, find Psalm 139 in point number two. Because part of the psalm of Psalm 139 deals with thanksgiving and praise to God, and another part of the psalm deals with vengeance and taking wrath and judgment against the enemies of God. So there is an overlapping. That's why it's hard to categorize some of these psalms. But we're looking at them by these categories, and we will look at Psalm 80 tonight. And the next time that we have our series on Sunday night, uh, we'll look at point number two, the Thanksgiving and Praise Psalms. Uh, We'll look at a psalm then and look at those more closely. When you come to Psalm 80, you have a psalm that was written not by David, but by Asaph. This psalm was probably written from Jerusalem. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem who were amazed and astonished at the captivity of the ten northern tribes when they went into Assyrian captivity in the year 722 B.C. The psalmist, Asaph, recognized God's people had removed themselves from God's will and the blessings found in the law of Moses. So the psalmist is expressing concern for God's people and uh, begs God to act and restore His people into a proper covenant relationship with Himself. This is found throughout the psalm. And it's very interesting that when we read and study these psalms, they are written by, of course, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that every word is the Word of God. Yet, the feelings and the emotions of the writer are being expressed in the Psalms. Just like when you read the book of Job. The feelings and the emotions of Job are found in the book. Job wishes he had never been born. Job, because of the suffering that he endured, wished he would have died at birth. And that is recorded for us because it's recording the the feeling and the thinking of Job. And so when we look into these psalms, we see the, the feeling and the outpouring of the psalmist to God, pouring out their heart to God. And I think we learn a valuable lesson, lesson as we look at these psalms that God wants us to pour out our heart to Him. As we pray and as we, as we worship Him, especially in prayer, and we're looking to God uh, for guidance and perhaps even um, deliverance from whatever problem that we're facing in our life, God wants us to express that in prayer. And I think we'll see this here in Psalm 80, verses 1 through 19. Look at verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come and save us. Verse 3, Restore us, O God. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse 3 is going to be repeated in verse 7 and in verse 19. This is emphasis. The psalmist is crying out for deliverance for the nation. Remember last week we we studied Psalm 3 where David was seeking individual deliverance from his enemies. It was an individual deliverance. Now we're looking at a national deliverance from the enemies of God. Verse 1, he talks about God being the shepherd of Israel. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. You lead Joseph like a flock. Joseph, of course, representative of the people of God, Israel. So God is oftentimes depicted throughout the Scriptures as a shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus depicts himself as the good shepherd in the New Testament, drawing on imagery from the Old Testament in John chapter 10. So God is seen here as the shepherd of Israel. He says also in verse 1, You who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. Those who were in the class on angels, we talked about cherubim, these spiritual beings, that are in the presence of God, they were depicted upon the Ark of the Covenant. 
on the top of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And God's presence was there in the Holy of Holies, there between the, these two representative uh, carvings of cherubim. And so God's presence was there in the Ark of the Covenant, or above the Ark of the Covenant. And He says, shine forth. Exodus chapter 37, verses 1-9 through 9, talks about the building of the Ark of the Covenant and those cherubims that were built on the top. So he's crying out to God, you dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. He says in verse 2, Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh of the twelve tribes, these three of the twelve tribes, represent the northern kingdom. So it, it was an astonishment of the psalmist Asaph that these people in the northern kingdom we're going through this terrible time. Now, it's their own fault. It's their own problem that they went into Assyrian captivity despite all that God had provided for them and prophets and the warnings in the law of Moses to not get involved with idolatry, not to get involved with the nations round about them. They ignored those warnings. Now the psalmist is astonished. And wants them to be saved, those who remain to be, stay, to be saved. Stir up your strength and come and save us. Look at verse 3. Restore us, O God. Cause your face to shine and we will be saved. As I said before, this is going to be repeated in verse 7 and in verse 19. It is a prayer of restoration. They want to be restored back to God. And Asaph, by inspiration, is crying out to God, Restore us, O God. And he says, Cause your face to shine. That phrase there means to look upon us favorably again. Look upon your people favorably again. God had, as it were, turned His face from them because of their wickedness and their rebellion. And the, the psalmist with this attitude of restoration and repentance, is saying, look on us again with favor. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. When you look upon us again with favor, we shall be saved, the psalmist says. Verses 4-7, through seven, he continues. He is, he is astonished about the concerning the sorrow that the people have concerning God's wrath against their sin. He says in verse 4, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and have given them the tears to drink in great measure. Given them tears to drink in great measure. Verse 6, You have made us a strife to our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. So the psalmist here is talking about how long, O Lord, are you going to be angry against us? How long are you going to be against our prayers? And notice the poetry here, very vivid. You have fed them with the bread of tears. Sorrow. Because they had ignored God's warnings, because they had turned their back on God's Word, God said what He promised, He did what He promised that He would do. He was going to bring the Assyrians down upon them into captivity. And He gave them bread for tears, poetically speaking. Giving them tears to drink in great measure, indicating poetically the sorrow that they were facing because of their rebellion to God. It says in verse 6, You have made us a strife to our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. The enemies of God are laughing at Israel for their rebellion and for God's treatment of them. Then he says in verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts. That phrase, God of hosts, is referring to God who is the commander-in-chief, the king, the leader of the armies of heaven. The host there, referring to the armies of heaven. Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine. Look upon us with favor once again, and we shall be saved. Verses 8 
through pretty much the rest of the psalm, Asaph is using the imagery of a vineyard to describe God's people. And how that God had delivered them from Egyptian bondage. Look at verse 8. You have brought a vine out of Egypt and you have cast out the nations and planted it. Talking about how God delivered Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Oftentimes, God's people are depicted as a vineyard. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 27, verses 2 through 6. Also in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 40. Israel is depicted as a vine. And he says, you took this vine out of Egypt, talking about deliverance from Egyptian bondage, and have planted it. Verse 9, you prepared room for it, you caused it to take deep root, and you filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadows, and the mighty cedars with its boughs. Verse 11, she sent out her boughs to the sea, and her branches to the river. Talking about how that Joshua, as you read in the book of Joshua, under his leadership, God took them into the promised land and as it were planted them. He toiled the ground as it were. He uh, prepared the land for them so that they could uh, take deep root and fill the land. He prepared the room for it. What did Joshua do when he went into the land? He conquered it uprooted the nations that were there so Israel could flourish as a nation. Talking about how that the nation spread, verse 10 and 11. He says, sent out her boughs to the sea. That's talking talking about the Mediterranean Sea. And her branches to the river. Talking about how the expanse of Israel went to even the Euphrates River. Verse 12. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by uh, the way pluck her fruit. The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the fi- field devour it. Hedges were there to protect. God broke down the hedges so that the enemies could come in. Poetically speaking, talking about these hedges that were around a, a vineyard to protect it from the wild animals. Now the hedges are gone. Strangers can come up into the vineyard and pluck the fruit from the vineyard. Verse 13, the boar out of the woods uproots it, goes into the vineyard and uproots it. The wild beast of the field devour it. Its protection is gone. Verse 14, return, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and visit this vine. Look at our calamity. Look at what has happened to us. And restore us once again, O God. Verse 15, And the vineyard which you, which your right hand has planted, and the branch that you have made strong for yourself. Verse 16, It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. This vine that you have planted has now been cut down and has been burned. Well, what was the problem? Israel wasn't bearing fruit anymore. They stopped being productive. They stopped being obedient to God's Word. That was the problem. Those who remained wanted to be faithful to the Lord once again. They wanted to be restored. That's why Asaph is writing this psalm. Verse 17. He says, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand and upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. The man of your right hand and the son of man, some translations just say upon the son, whom you've made strong for yourself, refers to Israel itself. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. Israel is called God's firstborn son out of Egypt. And so he's referring again to Israel and says, you please... Be, let your hand be upon your son. Take care of your son and make him strong for yourself. Verse 18. Then you will not, then, excuse me, we will not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. Revive us again. Restore us. We want to be back in fellowship with you. 
look down upon us once again with favor. Now the ten tribes of the north that went into Assyrian captivity, they never were restored as a nation. But those who were main from the ten northern tribes, individuals, could be restored, could find favor with God again. And this psalmist here is crying out to God, Revive us that we may call upon your name. Verse 19, we have this, this repeated once again. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. The psalmist is crying out to God and saying, How long are you going to be angry with us? How long are you going to ignore our prayers? Please restore us once again. Revive us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Look favorably upon us again. And we will be saved. We will call upon your name. We will be your people. You know, in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, Jesus takes the imagery that's found here in Psalm 80 and throughout the Old Testament concerning the people of God being a vineyard and applies it to Himself and His individual followers. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus is the true vine that never forsook God, that never turned on God. And individual Christians, individual disciples are the branches that are expected to bear fruit for God. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word that I, that I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You cannot be a productive, fruit-bearing person unless you abide in Christ, listening to His word and being obedient to His word, producing the fruit that's pleasing to the Father. Verse 5, again he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If the branch is not doing its job in producing fruit, it will be cut off from the life source, the vine will wither and die and be cast into the fire and burned. Verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. We have been called by God to listen to His Word Abide in His Word. Bear much fruit. Be productive in His vineyard as a productive branch. And when we do this, we will be glorifying the Father and we will be true disciples of Jesus Christ. But if not, as we learn from Psalm 80, that hedge of protection will be brought down. We will not be the productive people that God would have us to be will be displeasing in God's sight. And as Jesus said in John chapter 15, you will be cut off from the life source. You will be cut off as a branch that's unproductive, unfaithful to Him. And you will wither. And you will die spiritually. And you will ultimately, ultimately be lost and burned in eternal punishment. But if we abide in Christ, continue to live faithful to God, we will bear much fruit to glorify the Father, and we will be the disciples that God would have us be. Are you bearing fruit for Christ tonight? Are you productive in the vineyard? Are you a branch that is producing the fruit that God wants His people to, to produce? You can't do that unless you're a Christian. Believe in Jesus with all your heart. 
Make the great confession with your mouth that He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of, the, uh, of your sins. And you will be a part of the church. You will be a part. You will be a branch in which is connected to Christ. And you then can bear much fruit. As a branch, as a disciple, if you're not bearing fruit, you're in a sad condition. You will be cut off from the life source. Repent. Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and while we sing. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and all our many blessings. Bless those that are about to partake of this bread. May they be mindful that it represents the body of your Son who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before Thee again asking those, asking You to bless those that are about to partake of this fruit of the vine which represents the blood that your Son shed on the cross. May they partake of this in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Is there anyone wishing to give to the offering? Okay. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all our many blessings. Bless those who are about to give. May they give in a manner well pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is good to see everybody here again this evening. I uh, forgot one announcement this morning. We need to remember the wedding shower for Josh and Melissa. It will be three weeks from now. If you wish to give to the money tree, give that to either Jennifer or Laura, and they'll be putting that together because, as we all know, young married couples need money. So that's the only annou other announcements I had. If you would, uh, bow with me at this time. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, Lord, we're thankful for the blessings you give us. We're thankful for the opportunities that we have to come together to study your word. Lord, we ask that you would help us each to remember the importance of being here and the importance of the study of your word. And Lord, we ask that you would guide us as we go through this week. Help us to always look to you for our strength and our courage. Help us also to look to one another when we need help. And Lord, we ask that as we leave this place, you'll help us to realize that we're going out into a mission field, that it's all about us. And Lord, help this congregation to always stay strong in your word, to always prove the things that are being taught. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless Sean and Jennifer, and that you would give them many years in service to you. All these things, Lord, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.